Good evening, everyone. When I began my first year of high school, I was placed in regular English class and honors math. I never understood why, because English was my favorite subject and I always got all A's. It wasn't until I became a teacher that I realized my placement was most likely a result of my performance on standardized assessments. My reading comprehension scores were always my lowest. When I told my high school counselor that I wanted to apply to the University of Illinois, she told me to not even bother because my ACT score was not high enough and I wouldn't get in. Back then in high school, and currently in many high schools today, adults look at students as a, a test score. Thankfully, I did not follow the advice of my high school counselor. I did end up attending the University of Illinois, majoring in French and secondary education. Very well. Thank you. When it was time to apply for my first teaching job, I interviewed at Taft High School in Chicago. After the interview, I got a call from the principal saying they had chosen another candidate. About a week later, the principal called me back and asked me, one, if I still wanted the job, and two, if I was a minority, because he had to fulfill a minority quota for my position, and the white male that they originally offered the job to did not fill that quota. I know I'm right? I answered yes to both questions, thankful for the opportunity, but always thinking that I got the job based on my race and not necessarily because of my merit. After teaching for a few years, I received a Fulbright scholarship to teach in Dakar, Senegal, in Africa. I taught English to classes of 50 students, but only the students whose parents could afford to send them to school. The students at Lycée Blaise Dian were thankful for being there, but I also met countless kids who would have given anything to have attended school. This experience made me thankful for the American school system that provides free public education for all, but also very sad to see the inequities that exist in impoverished countries. All of these experiences contribute to my equity journey, and no matter where you are on your own equity journey, it is important to reflect on times when you felt as I did, so that we can better understand and empathize with our current student situations. After teaching for 11 years at Taft High School, I became an assistant principal at Mather High School in Chicago. Do we have Mather folks here today? Yes. Uh, when I started my job in July of 2007, one of the first things my principal asked me to do was fill the AP classes because he could not afford to have class sizes of 15. The students in these classes were hand selected and their teachers knew they had a good chance of succeeding in class and on the AP test. To search for students to fill those classes to a size of 28, I started reviewing transcripts looking for students who demonstrated success through their grades. What struck me was the number of students who had a transcript full of A's and never took an honors or an AP class. I maxed out the AP classes that year and realized that more students could be successful in AP classes if only they were given the chance. In subsequent years, we more than doubled the enrollment in AP classes without a decrease in the number of students who succeeded on the AP tests. The biggest increase in enrollment and success rates at Mather was an AP Spanish language class. When I started at Mather, we only had about 30 students in one section of AP Spanish language, but twice as many took uh, the AP Spanish language exam that year. I knew that there were students who were fluent in the language but were not in AP Spanish language class. That first year I asked over 30 Spanish speaking students to take the AP Spanish test cold turkey in May. 80% of them passed with a three or higher with no preparation whatsoever. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I am not advocating for these unconventional methods of student recruitment by any means, but these examples made me realize that there was so much untapped potential in our students and they were ready for the challenge. At my current school, East Lyon High School, there was some resistance from teachers when I proposed offering AP Spanish language to ELL students, English language learner students. But after they got fours and fives the first year that we did it, it is now a common practice to enroll our ELL students sometimes as early as freshman year, and many times after day one of school has already started. Sure, native Spanish-speaking students are likely to perform well on an AP Spanish language exam. However, what it does afterward makes all the difference. After seeing how successful historically underrepresented students performed in an AP class, this started shifting mindsets of adults and increasing the self-efficacy of our Latino students. If they could pass a college-level course in their own language and in the early years of high school, 
why not try other AP classes as their language skills developed? Adriana, who you will hear from shortly, is one of those students. In taking you through my equity journey, I hope that you realize that we in public education must use a different lens when looking at students beyond their grades or test scores. I compare the equity work that we have the honor of doing in partnership with the U.S. to that of using a microscope. We see our students every day and know a lot about them in terms of what we see on paper. Their grades, their attendance, and their test scores. But when we look more closely, as when looking through a microscope, we see a much different view. It changes what you see. It changes your perception of what you thought you were looking at. I challenge you and encourage you to use your equity lens when looking at your students and what they report to you on their insight cards. And you need to look at all of the details on the insight cards, not just the teacher recommendations or learning mindsets alone, but the whole picture. Every detail is a new understanding of that student that we may not have known before that helps us to see the full picture. Adriana in here and I looked at her insight card the other day. And for whatever reason, she did not receive any teacher recommendations. She is a former ELL student in four AP classes this year, currently as a junior, and she already has two fives under her belt. But no teacher recommendations. This is why we need to look at the whole child and what assets they have to offer. If you want to get to know someone better and be able to relate to them, you need to have a conversation with them. This is a cornerstone of the EOS work. By taking the time to review all that they've told you on the insight card, follow up with a conversation or two or three, seek to understand how they best learn, what supports they need to be successful, and what they want to do in life, you will have a richer picture of each individual student. They will tell you things like they want to go to college and they want to be more successful and that they can be more successful if their teachers offered redos and retakes. They will tell you that they want to be the first in their family to go to college and that they have dreams and aspirations to be happy and successful. Only when we truly know the students in front of us will we put in practice our belief that all students can learn. We didn't have all the answers during our first year of US. Even in year three, we are still figuring things out. We have more underrepresented students in our AP program than benchmark students but we still haven't reached equity. This doesn't mean that we, are, we will stop trying. Each year we learn something new and improve things from the year before. We have changed our drop policy and fees and used many of the resources that EOS offers like growth mindset and sense of belonging training and postcards to appear for every new student in an AP class. Our partnership with EOS has caused our building administration to look at just about everything with an equity lens. This work takes time and dedication, but it is worth it to see students' faces when they know that someone believes in them, when they feel connected to school, and when they know that they have the skills and knowledge to have many post-secondary options, and when they walk out feeling like they can do anything. We know that much of our work is shifting the mindsets of adults. We recently showed our staff that while over 90% of our students plan to go to college, only 63% of our staff believe that they could. I'm sure many of you have similar situations and challenges in your schools, but the more we hear about students like Adriana, the more we believe that all students deserve the opportunity to be their best selves. As you continue with your equity journey with EOS, do not give up. Do not make assumptions. Talk to each student multiple times. Support them. Make changes to current practices if they are barriers to opportunities for kids. Enlist your trusted adults. Is our model perfect? No. We keep trying new things each year, and now in our third year with the US, we are starting to build a culture of opportunity and high expectations for all students. We started a summer camp for skills and college visits. We are developing student supports, matching experienced AP students with AP students that are new. We know that we need to communicate better with families to explain what AP coursework is all about and how they can best support students at home. We know that our placement process needs revision to allow more students opportunities before they get to an AP class. This, works, this work takes time, it takes unwavering commitments, it takes a strong belief in our kids, and we have to do it now. As James Baldwin wrote in Nobody Knows My Name, the challenge is in the moment, the time is always now. The challenge is not for underrepresented students to do better. The challenge is for those in power to make a difference starting now.